what you're doing if the first row is empty, you're taking away the, the chairs from the first row. Don't force me to do that. Thomas, you can go to the first row. Huh? The best space is for the Thomas. Sometimes people run late. Okay. So it's five past the hour. I guess we can stop now. You see my nice t-shirt? Okay. Do you want to have one? But who, who screams loudest will maybe get one. So I will try to speak into the microphone. I ask you to do the same in the end. If you speak very close, you can hear yourself. Yes. But uh, on the live stream, you can even hear the audio if you are in this distance. Okay. Welcome to Coding Berlin. This is chapter number 2000. I did not count. Did anyone by any chance um, recognize what that image? On, on the large screen, you can, you can see it. Right? These, these are cho shopping carts. Ain't that great? So <laughs> our, our topic today is next-gen commerce. I, uh, if you want, you can also sit in the front row. There is yeah, yeah, sure. You are also free. Keep on taking. <laughs> this is your chance. It's, it's perfectly nice. Have you got something to drink? Very nice. OK. A color, if you want. Yeah, the good thing about the live stream is, uh, ah, OK. Who does not want to be on video? Who hates Facebook? Uh, sorry, YouTube. Uh, I, okay, this was no, no problem. Because we, we are streaming, so I'm on TV now. <laughs> People can see me, but there are not many online. And they can also see you. So don't look into this camera if you don't want to be seen. You can also wave to the camera. Say hello. <laughs> hello, Internet. <laughs> the last time we do a live, a live session. Okay. Um, hello. If you want, here are so many seats on taken. So, first of all, I'd like to say, to say thank you to Front Commerce, to Spryker, and to Shopmacher for sending speakers to us. I mean, they are not really sending. I mean, you, you, you decided on your own, I guess. But uh, yeah, thank you anyway. Um, we hear three talks today by Patrick Blom. Why we decided to build on our own commerce front end. I shortened the titles a little bit. I hope it's still true. Um, OK. By Mr. Marco Podien. Po po is it Podien? Podien. Oh, OK, sorry. Next gen headless commerce with Spryker Commerce OS. This is also true, I guess. Then the last one is Pierre Mar Mar Martin. Yeah. Martin. Pierre Martin, who went the long way from Toulouse to Berlin to have Vietnamese food with us and have a talk <laughs> <laughs> about federated headless systems and a unified GraphQL schema equals modern front ends. And if we still got time and you still want to sit here, we could have a panel discussion with all the speakers. There will be food around. 7.45, if you are not that fast. Never mind, the food cannot get cold because it already is cold. <laughs> <laughs> this, this time we ordered a little bit more than last time. Who has been here last time? Not that many as always here, yeah, right? But it's, it's always mixing. It's a mixed, a mixed audience. A word from Coding Berlin. We want to be a friendly and open hub for all Berlin developers. So if you're a developer, uh, this is the place to be, at least from my point of view. Rule number one, it must be code-centric. Everything we're doing should be code-centric because we are called Coding Berlin. Every meetup should come with a different developer-related topic. This is not true for all the other coding meetups. If, I don't know if you ever heard of them, but we also have Coding Stuttgart, we have Coding Leipzig, we have Coding Faro, we have Coding Portugal, and we might have Coding Düsseldorf in the very uh, close future. Mm, there we're doing anything, but here every meetup comes with a Focus dev developer related topic. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me or you can ask Tom, who you might have met at the entrance. So we are here for you. And if you want to talk to us, you can use our Twitter channel. You can also follow us. We need more followers. Follower power makes the world go round. Another word from uh, Coding Berlin. If you want to talk, if you want to host this meetup, or even if you want to suggest a topic, approach me, approach Tom, approach the community, and uh, we are absolutely happy to have you here to be at your side to talk about your company. And what I definitely would like to suggest is let's be more community. If someone of you wants to go to a hackathon and says, well, I'm so alone and I don't want to like, uh, I don't want to, to hack alone in the night, ask the people next to you. Who's going to a hackathon next month? Who has been to a hackathon last month? Uh, you are going, of course you are going. You even tweeted about it, but you're not telling it. The official symphony hackathon is upcoming and you're doing some stuff about API platform. Don't know what that is. Um, 
So if you want to, to do something like that, announce in the group what you want to do and where you want to go, and maybe people join us. Hello, Tino. Take your seat. Here are still three. I'm taken. Hello. I want to play a game with you. Uh, I don't know who is rather new here. Uh, usually for all the newcomers in our meetup group, I ask a very personal question. Are you a robot or not? This is the question. Uh, Tom, just to make sure that you're a real person, please drop a more or less meaningful human line. For example, what are you interested in coding or a Twitter profile that you can control or something that proves that you are made of flesh and blood. Sorry for that hassle, but there are a lot of spam bots flooding in currently and your profile is a little bit empty. So I can't decide if you're a real human just by that. Who has answered that question? Two, two, okay, two in the room. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm writing that to merely anyone. And I, I collected the best answers. So this guy without a name, uh, Tobias asked me the same question, is this human enough? Hey Stefan, yeah, I'm a real colleague of several attendees. We are all from Portal Tech, reply. Hmm. Hmm, that response could actually be created by a bot simply by scrapping the current attendees. My focus is test automation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone in the room said, this is an automated message clarifying I'm not a robot. Interesting, now I've been flagged by meetup spam filter. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. uh, hi dear Stefan, no worries, I can totally understand. Fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not a robot. I'm not not a robot, yeah, whatever. Okay, uh, so I have the very pleasure, but the problem is now uh, my counterpart is missing. Wait a second. Okay, we will do it. We will, we will do it later. So we will do. Ah, you found it. Yeah. Very well hidden. Okay, very nice. So look at the numbers. One thousand members. This means nothing in the Berlin community because everyone is joining all the communities, but I am quite proud that we made it that far. Today we are 1,080, so we crossed that line uh, beginning of February, I guess, and uh, 1,000 members. And you know who has been the 1,000th member? No. <laughs> A bot that sits... Uh, who was that? Was it you? Right, it's, it's you, isn't it? Okay, Carla, we got something for you. has been sponsored by Tobini Kreuzberg, which, uh, <laughs> which are hosting these meetups. Um, we uh, at least try to be community, okay? So it's about the people, it's not about Tobina, but I have to mention them. Tobini Kreuzberg is a great company. We're hiring. Uh, promotion by Coding Berlin. Someone approached me and asked me to promote it, then I had a look at it, and I must say I'm totally amazed. Who of you is a Golang programmer? <laughs> okay, Tino is... No one. Who's interested in Golang? Yeah, Mark was, oh, okay, oh, yeah, a little bit, okay. But Go is a great language, at least people say so. Mm. And I guess one of the largest conferences of Go is happening May the 30th until June the 1st. And it's happening in Tenerife. This is Spain, but it's not really Spain, it's actually Africa, but it's an island. If you never have been there, you have to go there. If you want to go there, you can go to a conference. The conference is around 300 uh, euros regular. And I think it's a 50% discount code that they gave us it's called We Love the Community. If you want to learn, go, go there. Have a nice vacation and visit this conference. Remember this code. It can save you 100 euros. We love the company. You got it? Community. community. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Freud, I'm sorry. Um, okay, you got it? Nice. The second promotion by Coding Berlin is a promotion for the Tobini Kreuzberg internal, or oh, well, external developer conference. It's called Dev Day. It's going to be amazing. It has an incredibly well made website. <laughs> Thank you. It's happening <laughs> on May the 25th. We got talks, we got people, and we got a coding challenge 
sponsored by Platform, or the Platform is H, I don't know. So Pla Platform will sponsor it. It's going to be great. We are, it's happening at Festa Kreuzberg and our office in uh, Faro, Portugal, simultaneously. Tickets are 10 euros, <laughs> this early bird. But um, um, from April onwards, it's around 20. So uh, if you want to, get f to, to go there for free, for free, it's a free beer, free software, let there be code. All in capital letters. You can go there for free. Let there be code. Remember it. Take it down. Hello. Take a seat. There are two seats untaken. There are two seats untaken. Nice to have you here. More coders. And uh, since you are late, uh, watch that screen. Remember the code. You can go to the Dev Day for free. Amazing. You only have to type in let there be code at the Eventbrite ticketing page. Dennis tried to pay with PayPal. It's not working. You have to take it down, right? So with this one, you don't have to struggle with PayPal. I'm already close to the end. No. Very good. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Mm, this was the end. <laughs> 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 this meetup topic is called Next Gen Commerce. And now I think we can give it away for Mr. Patrick Blum. Yeah, it works. Great. Yeah, awesome. Um, welcome, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for the noise. <laughs> um, this is front end versus checkout, um, or uh, in a more detailed way, uh, why we decided to build our own e commerce front end. Um, my name is uh, Patrick, and I'm a regular PHP developer. And I work for a company called Shopacher. Uh, as you might guess from the name, we are not the traditional agency. We focus only on e-commerce projects, and um, this is our beautiful new building. Yeah, we moved there in October last year. It's really, really cool because everything is new, and everything smells new. <laughs> really cool. So uh, we are located in a Gesha, and uh, today I think I work about five and a half years there. Who knows where Gesha is located, by the way? Awesome. I expected something. So there is Gesha, <laughs> yeah, and as you can see, Berlin is a little bit... Yeah, so it was a quite long journey today, but I'm quite happy to be here. So we at Shopmacher, we love e-commerce, yeah, and this talk is gonna about uh, the e-commerce solution we build for our customers. Um, these are some of our customers. I don't want to talk about everything in detail, but I want to show this slide because I will show some content from Engbers and Zumrode during the slides and. Um, just for a legal purpose here. So this talk is built like a time travel. So we will start in uh, a few years back and have a look at how we build shops. And then we go further and further and show how the process is going on until we reached our own custom front end and what's the, um, yeah, what's the, um, the motivation behind it. So let's start in 2013. Uh, exactly in April. This was my start at Shopmacher. And before I started to work for Shopmacher, I worked with some, yeah, small e-commerce systems. I don't know, who knows XT Commerce? Who? Great. <laughs> Presta Commerce? Gra who loves it? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, um, so I, uh, I worked with this kind of non-object oriented uh, e-commerce solution. And if I started to work for Shoma, I directly jumped in in a more object oriented way, uh, which was uh, Oxid eShop, which is still our uh, one of our favorite e-commerce system. And um, I want to have a look at a couple of e-commerce systems in the year 2013. So let's start to have a look at Oxid eShop. Um, in 2013, Oxid eShop was in version 4.6 till 4.8, depending on the um, on the edition you're running on, because there are three one, the, uh, a free one, a community, then an enterprise, and there's a professional edition too. And um, all these versions had some, or these editions had something uh, something similar. So in 2013, there was no DIC, there was no events, 
but there already was a module uh, configuration and uh, also a way to extend these e-commerce systems. And they had a really, really special um, backend because it's a, it's a frame set. And um, yeah, just for a short look what Oxid looks like in 2013. Um, let's have a look at Shopware. Shopware was in version 4.1, which means we have the old plugin structure. The new one is more similar like the Symphony bundles, you might know. And um, they already had no DIC. They had some, yeah, there was something similar, but it's, it was really, really down uh, inside the code and you don't have the possibility to extend it. Um, so it was a quite functional uh, e-commerce solution, but not as far as they are today. And um, then there was uh, Commerce Tools, for example. What about Commerce Tools in 2013? Nothing, because there was no Commerce Tools in 2013. The first release was uh, in 2014. So, and Commerce Tools is such a, yeah, a more uh, a more microservice-based approach, so it's more like, uh, like a transaction uh, software uh, instead of a basic e-commerce system. And uh, it's really cool that someone of Spriker is here today because when was the first release of Spriker? Um, it's, it's been since 2012. When, when was the first official release which you can Google? Okay, then I then my research is badly wrong because I Google it and I found out that it was for uh, I found out it, uh, or that it should be in two or should have been in 2016, but it was it was earlier. Okay, great, but there was no Spriker in 2013. Not under the frame. Okay, okay, great. <laughs> so no Spriker for everyone in 2013. Yeah. Um, so, but we had to build shops. So we focused on this kind of monolithic approach. Yeah? So you have the, these, uh, the software which, uh, which you install and um, basically we worked, or mostly we worked with, uh, with uh, Oxid eShop because this is the e-commerce solution we have the most knowledge in it. And also we worked with Shopware but not so much in deep in uh, 2013. So let's have a look at a traditional e-commerce system and how we customize it, just for short. This is a traditional e-commerce system. Yeah, everyone is confused. Great. So um, let's imagine the light is a module, the wheels are a module, the paint is a module, and but in complete, it's an e-commerce system. Yeah, you can drive it, sell your products. And if a customer comes to us and said, "Okay, I'm not so yeah, the lights are not so cool. So please change the lights." What? <laughs> Ouch. Okay, so, better? Change anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes? No? Better? So, everyone hear me? Okay, me too. <laughs> so, um, yeah, for, uh, so, what was the way we go if we want to change the lights? we just simply write a feature module. Yeah? So we uh, take this small feature, which is basically a collection of files. Uh, we have a light controller, a light module, a metadata PHP, which is something special from the Oxid e-commerce system. This is the file where you uh, announce all the changes of the, of the e-commerce system, and the SQL migration and the light view. So, and we rolled it out, changed the lights, customer's happy, everything's fine. Small change just for the look and feel of the e-commerce system. Great. Yeah, a couple of months later, the customer said, okay, the last change was in spring, now we have summer. And yeah, I want to have the look and feel of my shop a little bit more different. It's just a small change. You can change it maybe in a minute or an hour or two. Um, I want to have the shop looking like this, yeah? But l the lights are the same, by the way. <laughs> so, and we said, okay, that's, a, that's quite complex because every feature is identi uh, identically, but only the look of the shop changes and only the presentation of the products changes. So 
we said, okay, let's divide it in some features or in some modules and then start. And so we, because we already have the feature module, we start to extend it with the feature extended module. Yeah, so uh, now we add the bumper because uh, here, as you can see, there's a bumper in the other one, there was no real one. So we added a bumper controller, a model and the view, roll it out, clear. Yeah, so far, so good. Yeah, in autumn, the customer calls us again and said, okay, um, we have a little small change here. Yeah, the e-commerce system should now look like this. And we said, okay, great, let's do this. So um, there's no bumper anymore, so we have to remove the bumper. So we have the feature custom extended module. Yeah, as you can see, the name gets quite complex. And uh, now we remove the bumper, we have the wheel controller, and we also have the wheel, uh, wheel view and a wheel model, but we also have a bumper module because we don't really know if another module depends on this model. So just to keep safe, um, yeah, to be safe, let it there. Um, yeah, and It happens sometimes that the customer calls us during these kind of uh, changes and said, okay, wait, um, we uh, want to stop the complete process because we want to prepare for next, for next summer, but uh, the look and feel should be like this. And at this point, every developer starts freaking out. Yeah, as you can see, it, it's, it, it's a work, but it's not a, a work everyone likes. So. And in 2013, exactly in uh, July, um, the first idea of a product comes here to get rid of all these kind of changes. Yeah? And because we had all, have all the knowledge uh, uh, with Oxid eShop, uh, we said, okay, let's build a solution for Oxid eShop first. So this is uh, the Oxid eShop system, which is uh, how it looks today. I, sadly, I don't found an image for, from 2014. So um, yeah, this is the, the shop system, how here it looks. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so as you can see here, there's, um, some, uh, here's a banner, uh, or which is a banner slider and some products, and we gave, want to give our customers more flexibility to this. Yeah? So we don't want to change all the lights and the wheels and the bumpers, and the customer should do this by their own. Yeah? And they should do it simple. Not the way Magento do it. We don't want to deploy everything only for change of an, of an XML structure. So we want the more flexibility for our customers. We want that they can do something like this. So just flipping it, yeah? or maybe remove the products. And with this idea, we started to create a product called Commerce Cockpit. And the Commerce Cockpit is basically the start of the development of our own front end, because um, it's uh, software as a service, JavaScript, single site application based on Symfony. Yeah? So it's a separate, uh, a separate application where you can edit the content of your e-commerce system yeah? in a more detailed way than the e-commerce system already provides because in Oxid there already is a possibility to change some content inside, um, but we want to do this with product lists and also with uh, the content of nearly any page. So the technical view of this is pretty simple. It's like this, you have the commerce cockpit, then you have a PHP updater and the e-commerce system and the PHP applicator, uh, updater replicates the information from the uh, commerce cockpit into the e-commerce system. Yeah? And it's also a bi-directional communication because you want, uh, we found a solution to encapsulate functionalities and um, makes them editable, no, not editable, usable inside the commerce cockpit. So for example, a newsletter form. If you have a newsletter form in your e-commerce system, we found a solution to wrap this functionality into a widget and then the customer can just drag it wherever he wants inside the commerce cockpit. So, and yeah, this is the basic idea behind. And we ended up with this product uh, I don't want to talk about anything here because as you can see, it's quite a large product. The uh, interesting point is stage here, which is the first one. Stage replica uh, represents the, um, yeah, the stage of your e-commerce system. 
So uh, as you can see, you have some more points here. You have cloud where you can add some content or images or movies or so on. You have push where you can create some discounts for uh, special purposes and so. And on stage, you have the uh, navigation here on the left, which represents the navigation of your e-commerce system. And then you have the page views here. These are the one we I recently uh, worked on. By the way, this is the Converse cockpit from Angus. This is the reason why we see Angus content. And if I uh, click on the navigation point here, I can see several pages. And if I click on it, I can see, okay, pretty cool. It's, a, it's a what you see is what you get editor where you can drag and drop some, uh, some content and then uh, you can edit uh, your product lists and so on. So, and this was quite progress. Yeah, this was really cool. Our customers liked this solution because it's a more detailed solution than the uh, original um, e-commerce system provides. So let's go further. Let's go in 2014. In 2014, especially in March, we worked a lot on the commerce cockpit. Yeah. So um, because it's a symphony application, we learned a lot from symphony. We um, had some consultings for, especially for symphony, and we found out okay we already have these feature custom extended module structure. Yeah, so the next part was how um, we, we, uh, how we refactored our, uh, our modules because there are still some modules which are necessary for the e-commerce system or the customization, um, which are not really uh, not um, influenced by the, uh, by the front end view. So, we learned a lot about Composer and we loved Composer. We use it every day. So we, st we started to think about how can we divide the implementation of the module from the domain logic. And this is where it, com uh, where it, it ends. We have now the, the implementation of the, uh, of the module and the domain logic separated. So this is a is a pretty cool thing because now we can use the domain logic also for other e-commerce systems, for example, for shopware. But at this point of time, we didn't know that. Um, but if you want to divide your domain logic from the regular e-commerce system, especially in Oxid, you have to use a dependency injection container. But in 2014, there was no dependency injection container. So we think about, hey, let's build our own. No, don't do this. It's, <laughs> it's a really, really bad idea. Don't do this. So um, we take the one we know from Symfony and created a really, really small wrapper for it that we can put this into Oxid. Yeah. So uh, th and this was the creation of the uh, SMDIC. Uh, today, which is really cool, there is uh, a dependency injection uh, solution for Oxid, um, but because all our modules still use uh, our implementation, we don't have switched to every new module for this. So um, this small wrapper is really, really, a really, really thin wrapper. So you have, um, it, for example, it can only parse XML structure. Yeah? So the uh, definitions of the services can only be written in XML. Um, we have uh, a get service, a get parameter, a set parameter. Um, we have a very, very light way of compiler passes, which we can use inside the module implementation, but we have no tags, for example, now, just to explain how thin this layer is. And this was really cool because this starts our modules to the next level. So, still 2014, but all just. Um, we refactored all modules. Yeah, so, and our customers worked more and more with the commerce cockpit and some customers said okay it's quite cool that it's natively integrated in in oxid because it's an oxid module i can just activate it and i can use my content here but um other customers said okay cool solution but we want to have shopware and the front end development says okay we want to have some cool new stuff we want to have native uh, some cool JavaScript frameworks, which which are not so easy to implement into a native uh, software because you can you can crack some it. And we found some problems with the caching structure during the usage of the commerce cockpit. So, yeah, the result was that the um, the 
basic limitation of the commerce cockpit was the uh, front end of the e-commerce system itself. So we start to decouple the start page and the content page of the e-commerce system completely from the, from the view. We decoupled the product list and search results list. And we decoupled the article details page and uh, for this customer especially all the outfit details page. And this was the creation of something we called base frontend. Yeah, this was the creation or the beginning of our own e-commerce frontend. And the idea was cool and every developer likes it because it, it's like a green place. You can just build your own frontend from scratch. Um, but it does not fit with this kind of implementation here because it's nearly a bi-directional communication to the, uh, to the shop system. So now the setup or the process uh, must change. Today it looks nearly like this. There are some more detailed points, but basically it looks like this. As the communication goes only from the updater to the, uh, to the shop system, it goes also to uh, the base front end. And what is really cool or really special here, the base front end um, gets this data only from the search implementation. So we added in a search system, we, formally, we first started with Fact Finder and then till today we used Elasticsearch. Uh, some customers already use um, Zemnox or so on. So basically the search implementation can also be changed um, because there is a thin wrapper between um, the implementation and the base front end node and we try to keep it um, simple as we can. So now, um, the e-commerce system provides the data to the search and the search um, provides the data to the base front end. And this makes the front end really, really fast. It's awesome because you have no database interactions here. So uh, no is not correct, you have less database actions here, but it makes it really, really fast. And we also have a bi-directional connection between base front end and the shop system. Why? Question to the audience. Session and cart. Session and cart, exactly. Because you want to show the mini basket in the header. Or if you're um, using the, um, the checkout, uh, you want to show the header, which uh, can be edited into the front end. So because of this structure, we have now the separation of the front end and the checkout. So if a customer comes to an e-commerce solution, of us, he will see every detail or every product representation uh, from base front end. And as you go to the checkout process, so as you go to the My Account or the checkout and um, the registration page and so on, you're on the native e-commerce system. And this is because <laughs> writing uh, a checkout process is a tough task. Writing payment implementations is a tough task. No one wants to write his own payment implementation because the word pain is already inside. <laughs> yeah? So this is the reason why we, why we separate it. And now it's really cool because now the shop system can be nearly everything. It can be Oxid, it can be shopware, it can be e-commerce tools, it can be whatever we want. So. This is cool because this gives the customer more freedom. If a customer says, okay, I like your solution, but I don't like Oxford Shopware or Commerce Tools, whatever, I want to have Magento, okay, great. Let's build a solution for Magento. Um, and with build a solution, I mean build proxy modules because this is something you um, have to change um, because uh, e-commerce system like Oxid or Shopware is not built to provide information about the shopping cart um, for, the, uh, for the whole world uh, with a JSON API. So we have to create such modules that we can, for example, add a product to the cart with a uh, JSON API. Um, so you have to create several endpoints here for yeah, uh, product adding to the cart, remove from the cart, um, add something to the which uh, to the wash list, uh, wash list, <laughs> to the to the wish list, um, and so on. And this is something we have to write for every new shop implementation now. So 
if the cust uh, if we haven't already won. If, if the customer said, okay, um, I want to have Magento, and we said, okay, we have no proxy, proxy modules for Magento, we have to build them. And this makes, well, this comes with some special thing because we have to secure the communication between the base front and base checkout here. Um, if, the, if you are not in a dedicated virtual LAN or so on, um, you have to secure it uh, on, the, on, the, on the regular using SSL or so on so that the connections are definitely encrypted. And this makes the whole situation extremely flexible. Some years later, so we put some work on it here, uh, now we in 2018, in June, we started a proof of com a concept with a company called Videro. Who knows Videro? No one, okay. Who knows digital signage? No one, great. <laughs> okay, Videro is a digital signage company. Digital signage means um, presentation of content at the point of sale. So if I'm a regular retailer and I want to show some information about the products, I can just roll out such a roll out display in front of my store or I can hang up such a nice display and put some content on there with Videro. And one of our customers, Zumnode, it's a shoe seller, started to work with Videro and um, add some displays to their main store to inform the customers about latest products. And we said, okay, this is a cool, uh, this is a cool uh, thing. Let's have a look how can we combine the e-commerce system with this, uh, this presentation. Yeah, so with this uh, presentation and this, it looks like this. Uh, this is, by the way, in our in our main office. Uh, we have a duplicate one of the uh, screen. The other one is uh, in the store of Zumnode. And here you can just tap on the content here and you end up with some product list. Yeah? And you can swipe this product list here. And if you click on an, on, an, uh, on an article, you will see some details about it and a QR code so that you can directly shop uh, this article online or turn around and go into the store if it's open, yeah? So, and this, at this point, we said, okay, great. Now, th this was so easy possible using base front end because we can just simply, uh, simply change the uh, uh, view for, from the base front end, which is editable for the commerce cockpit. So this product list is filled from the commerce cockpit. It's a dedicated product list. You can put some product in there and can spread it to all the Videro panels. And this is really cool because this is uh, the, the solution we built for, um, for our customers. We never thought about it for uh, a couple of years that this something is so possible. So yeah, it, it, and it was really fun to work on it yeah, because it's also a green place. So now uh, 2019, uh, exactly today, we looked uh, we have a look at the six years of e-commerce evolution. So um, if I thought or think about the, the start of the commerce cockpit, this approach was really new to everyone uh, in our company. So the expectation was not so much, but there was a team on it and they worked hard on it. And today we see there is a movement from this monolithic approaches to more microservice-based approaches. So you can, uh, now it does not matter where I buy the product. Is it on my smartphone? Is it in the store? Or is it on the, uh, on the regular desktop page? But it should have been at the same, uh, for the same uh, company, yeah, so. But they have the possibility to spread um, the channels to sell their products. And this comes with some, yeah, some things you have to keep in mind because this kind of microservice approach is more infrastructure. Is more infrastructure you have to handle. Um, you need to have a good partner for this, and yeah, there are some things, some lessons learned about these uh, ab about these uh, creation of, of of software here. And uh, one thing is uh, maintaining. Yeah, maintaining a software as a service application is not so easy. 
because you have to talk to your customers. You have to say no to your customers because some customers said, hey, I want to have this feature. Please put it in the application. And you said, have, they have to say no because it's not a feature every customer needs. We can have a look if we use this or if you can handle this on the project side. And by the way, we found a solution for this, um, but it, it gets too much in detail here. Um, but it's really necessary or really important to think about when you say no and when you say yes to the customers because there are already features which every customer created in the in a project in a project context and later on we moved it to the native app so uh, you also have to say um, yes to the customers and you have to talk to your customers a customer is not really happy if you deploy something and the whole service is not running anymore yeah something we have to learn and um, <laughs> what really important is, don't write a JavaScript application with PHP developers. <laughs> yeah? Because one of our main tasks today is it to get a good future safe code base uh, because we did some things inside the software. Yeah, we didn't know it better at this point of time. So today, we have really, really good JavaScript, uh, JavaScript developers, and they said, "Oh, d this we have to rework this completely." So, yeah, and this also has to be done with no uh, offline time. Yeah? So, one thing more you have to keep in mind. And the last thing is you have to think about um, logging. We have to improve. Uh, we had improved uh, to improve our logging. Um, today we use centralized log services, so we don't have to SSH into every machine. Uh, the support can use it. This is something the um, the customer and only this and also the support um, really loves it. So, and the last thing, this is really hard. The commerce cockpit is not the holy grail. This was a bad thing we had to learn, because if you start creating a product, you put so much patience in it. And nearly every customer who walks by, you said, this is cool. You have to try the solution. It's awesome. Please buy it. And yeah, that, but that does not fit on every customer. Because today, we also had customers which are really, really happy with a basic Oxid installation or a basic shopware installation. Because there is no so much movement on the product pages anymore for them. Uh, or it's just a, a test how how uh, will uh, if you if you create a brand you want to test okay is it a brand which is successful on the e-commerce then you don't want to set up this kind of of, um, of approach here because you want to have something like a speedboat so just set up a small application a small shop system and just look how the brand and the shop system works together so this was really hard because for all the for all the developers on the team, um, but it's still true. And for that, I would say thank you very much. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask, please. <laughs> yes. Oh, you? I think. Yes, please. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we improve the way how we talk to our customers in front. So instead of, of going here and throwing all the all the, this product on it, we said, okay, what is your need? What do, what do you need? Um, did you need a, a transaction platform for for commerce, or did you need just a, a one page where you want to sell one product or so on? And this was an improvement inside the sales context. So we improved the sales context here. Uh, we learn, uh, we, we, now we, we talk more to our customers. We um, yeah, had some several documents for it where, the custom, where, where we go through and talk to the customer and said, okay. And then we said, this could be a solution, but keep in mind, it's not a solution for a short, uh, for, for, for a speedboat or so on. It's a solution for a long term distance. Other questions? Oh, did, did this answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, please. Uh, so, when you want to integrate a new shop system, how long does it roughly take you? 
Um, I can't say a, th a fixed number here because it depends on the shop system, what it provides before. So shopware was, by the w uh, was for example, much easier to implement or to write the proxy models for because there is already a, a kind of JSON API. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, I, I'm sorry, I cannot say a number, so I cannot say it will be took six months or so, um, but it depends definitely on the on the e-commerce system. So if it is an, a tran uh, transaction uh, transactional driven approach, so like commerce tools or so, um, I think commerce tools it was ready in three months or so. I don't know really. So if the system is not so much close from the source here, then uh, it can be really really fast. Exactly, um, this is the way we go there. And um, this means sometimes that you have talked to the, to the manufacturers because some functionalities are not provided for the outside world. Yeah, so there is something where you say, okay, um, this could be a core change. I don't know if there is any known one. I don't think so because uh, uh, we we are really good in contact, especially with Oxid. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, definitely we create such such models because it's 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 only one module where we can add all these information. It's just the the providing endpoint module, the proxy module, and um, it could be that the endpoints were not so much. Um, configurable for a shop system because it does not provide it, but the basic functionalities are for every shop system the same. Okay. More questions? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry? Exactly, Moin. <laughs> uh, uh, the company is located in Gescher, but I live in Ochtrup. Uh, Münster. It's about Münster. It's about 50 kilometers. Yeah. It's awesome. We have also PHP user group. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, and I have to correct my slides. <laughs> yes, picture. Could you please look alive on the picture? <laughs> Move. Shake your head. Uh, raise your hand. Raise your hand, everyone. Yeah, very nice. Way good. You look amazing. You look amazing. The next talk is by our very good friend Marco Bodin from Spryker. And he will tell us uh, when Spryker has been founded. Um, yeah, it will be part of the thing actually. Speak close to the microphone, stage is yours. Uh, I think that um, when I have my speaker voice, then I'm loud enough even from a bit of a distance from the microphone. Um, can everyone hear me in the room or am I just mistaken about this assumption? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Marco. Um, I work for a company called Spryker and uh, first of all, all, I would like to know who has heard about Spryker here. That is a lot more than I expected. Who has worked with Spryker here? Very good. <laughs> um, that is good. So, um, so first of all, hi, my name is Marco. I've been with Spryker for uh, four years now. <laughs> for one reason or another, people tell me that I do not look like this picture at the moment. And someone narrowed it down to the suit. Also, it might be about five years old and there might be about five kilograms between now and then. <laughs> Um, I've been working for Spryker for um, almost four years now. I've been hired a bit later, so my employee number is uh, not as low as it should be. But when I entered the room at Spryker the first time, there were like 
five people sitting there. So, and um, the CTO back then, Fabian, gave me a laptop and then I did not leave the company anymore from that moment. And uh, some of you here I almost know as long as um, I've been in this company and other people here I even interviewed for Spryker who worked for Spryker briefly and um, yeah, I'm still there. I don't know why. So, um, <laughs> no, of course I know why. <laughs> Um, I've been developing for, um, for, I think, almost 20, year now, 20 years now. Um, I started with PHP, then at the university I did mostly Java and stuff, and professionally I've almost exclusively uh, worked with PHP over my career. So um, the first couple of slides look a little bit more fancy than um, I would usually <laughs> display, but I uh, threw them together from a business deck that um, I found somewhere in our Google Drive. So. Um, why did we build Spryker the way we build it? So um, uh, it is about um, the separation of backend and frontend, and I will repeatedly come back to that topic. Um, it's about um, built-in performance and scalability. It's about um, package principles and decoupling of concerns and these things. Um, we have a nice thing for uh, coordinating order processes that we um, uh, realized with a state machine and we are um, like very focused on good code quality, on um, clean code and um, also good architecture. Um, those of you who did not raise their hands when I asked about knowing Spryker, who knows Rocket Internet? Okay, so I hope that, so who does not know Rocket Internet? Maybe that's the easier question. <laughs> this this tells me that it it's still presenting. Rocket Internet. <laughs> okay, so the uh, slide is. Should I just stand here? Yes, please. <laughs> so. Um, the the first generation. We, we also embrace Spryker, I must say. <laughs> we have you touch this one. I have to move. <laughs> okay, I'm not allowed to touch this one, so I will continue like this. Um, so, um, Spryker actually started as the foundation for all the early rocket internet startups. Um, some of you might have worked for a rocket startup or another and have been in contact with systems called Alice and Bob. These were like the ancestors of the current Spryker system. Um, let's say at some point uh, managers from the, um, yeah, from the high levels of uh, Rocket Internet did not agree to what the um, founders of Rocket Internet had in mind as a management style and so they decided to uh, leave the company and together with the Otto Group found something that's now called Project A Ventures. It's an operational venture capitalist. That means they do not only uh, give you money um, if they are like convinced of your ID and the um, composition of the founding team, but they will also give you expertise um, on actually every level you can imagine in one of these companies. They give you HR, um, developers first of all, they give you marketing, so everything you can wish for there. And they um, not only provide mentorship like in many other programs, but also like um, work as part of your company for the early phases of these companies. And um, then the Alice and Bob system that was founded in uh, Rocket Internet and was actually also the foundation of the first iterations of the Salando system um, evolved into something that is called Eve and Z as um, equivalent to um, Alice and Bob. And um, out of that, Spryker was founded out of Project A. So um, we still have the namespaces Eve and Z for the back and the front end application. And if you work with Spryker, you will encounter that basically every day. But um, for marketing reasons, um, or actually for reasons of clarity, we use different um, terminologies for the um, shop application and the Spryker Commerce OS, which is the uh, former Z system. So this is basically the commerce core system that um, we have. Um, we position ourselves um, usually somewhere in the middle between companies that actually do not really need any um, technology-driven approach and companies that live by this technology-driven approach. So what we provide is um, the technological foundation to um, build very customized and technology-driven stuff without taking too much of the ownership of the underlying platform, like for example, Google, um, Amazon, 
extreme examples I know, or um, Wayfair, Etsy um, do. Um, how we compare ourselves to um, competitors is that we kind of uh, twist around this pyramid of uh, customization. So um, other um, e-commerce solutions give you a very standard set of features and they allow you to um, put your uh, customization on top and for Spryker it's actually the other way around. It's not that we provide fewer features but our focus is rather to enable you to um, put your customization on top of our code and we try to make it as easy as possible for you and to, to get out of the way wherever you would like to put something on your own. So um, this Spryker Commerce OS um, provides you with all the functionality that you um, need in an e-commerce system. Um, we allow for third-party integrations. Uh, we have a strong focus on code quality and um, solid software design, as mentioned earlier. And this is actually um, a collection of these functionalities that are also connected to a queue system, um, a database, a job scheduler. These are all details. I don't want to bother you with that. Um, if you have questions, you can um, ask me later, or actually you can ask like people here, people there, they have all a bit of Spryker experience. Um, how do we connect the Spryker Commerce OS to um, anything that might be uh, customer facing? So um, at first, because we are also um, kind of like old in the first approaches with this Alice and Bob system, we had this um, shop application called Eve and um, that was like completely decoupled from the Spryker Commerce OS and um, in the uh, like years, um, in the in the uh, last years, there was um, a huge like uh, trend to go uh, through this API approach. So we, in parallel to the Eve application, built uh, something that we call the Glue API, and that is uh, going to be most of the topic of this talk. I hope, if I did not copy too many of these uh, marketing slides, and. Um, these two applications are um, relying on the same functionality that is uh, provided th through a client layer that is capable of communicating with the Spryker Commerce OS as well as um, like an underlying uh, set of data storages that provide a denormalized and read optimized model. This is basically the way that Spryker achieves this um, performance and scalability by taking the stuff that is in the back end um, in this relational uh, database, usually it's Postgres, we are also compatible with other database systems, another uh, detail, and um, through a more or less um, complex mechanism um, makes it denormalized and re-optimized available to this client layer. And um, building the Glue API um, in parallel to the shop application based on the client layer allows us to reuse a lot of the functionality that we already built over the last year. So we do not have to reinvent the wheel. We can um, actually start from a already fairly round wheel um, that we can use. Uh, oh, maybe I was inspired by this round thing. So um, the business motivation behind this is that um, the customer journey becomes more complex over the years. And um, there's actually no end we can see. Um, the customer lifecycle has a growing number of touch points the customer has with you, and um, you, you cannot predict how, where, and when the customer um, wants to interact with something where like, you want to be to um, like, also display your services, your products, and something like this. So um, the markets of um, mobile, for example, uh, are rising rapidly, so desktop is actually a um, shrinking and um, some segments actually disappearing margin of um, e-commerce revenue source. Then um, we are currently tending heavily um, towards B2B feature sets and um, this is because the market is much bigger, so if you are not really in contact with these things you would not believe that, but um, the B2C market is predicted to have a volume of $3.2 billion in 2020. The B2B market is more than twice than that. And um, there's, uh, okay, this dollar sign you have to ignore because this is actually the number of estimated devices. is 26 um, billion connected devices um, for the IoT market. Actually, in that case, it should... <laughs> <coughs> 
Um, so there is no end to the prediction of what the IoT market can provide in terms of revenue. So this is definitely if you are um, going to, um, to, to be a part of this market, now is the time. Now you can put your foot in the door and um, try to uh, like establish yourself as um, a company that um, kind of can basically react to everything that is coming. And um, this is uh, also like a trend we see for many years. So um, I guess that most of you are about my age. I think maybe a bit younger, maybe a bit older. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. <laughs> no. I know, you're not that much older. <laughs> and um, we all, most of us probably um, grew up with um, a desktop computer. Then we saw that um, responsive design slowly uh, came into our world because we all had mobile phones with WAP or something like this. And then we saw the rise of the iPhone from 2007 and um, Android phones or later iPhone generations from there on. And, um, functionality began to be uh, built for mobile devices first because this is, um, Google already predicted this years ago that this market would be much bigger in most, if not all of the se um, segments that you can imagine. Um, then there came like very unexpected devices, the smartwatch, um, this, I think this is supposed to be a smart band or so. Then we have, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, this is probably a virtual reality device and um, an app ecosystem. Then we have um, dash buttons, which are only virtual anymore, of course. <laughs> but they still exist. They also still look like this, just not tangible. And um, voice commerce is also a big trend. Also bots and messaging and stuff. So actually, what this timeline is supposed to tell us, um, we do not know. We do not know. We cannot predict and we also should not predict what's to come. So we should be prepared for anything that comes. And um, what do we need for that? We need an API. So um, you want to have uh, your data, you want to be present wherever the customer is, and you do not want to make assumptions right now where this could be in, I don't know, half a year, one year, two years, something like this. And um, because of that, um, we, I think I already said this, we created um, the Glue API as a application that lives in parallel to um, the shop application. And basically any um, like imaginable front end can be connected through this and you can reuse established e-commerce functionality in, um, through this API. So um, this was the introduction and um, now I actually want to tell you uh, something about what the Glue REST API in Spryker actually is. So um, it's actually not an API per se, but it's, um, it's an infrastructure um, for an API framework. That means um, whatever application you have here, this basically uh, provides you to have endpoints that allow you to um, theoretically at least um, provide any kind of API that um, yeah, you, your um, applications might need. So if you already have existing applications that talk to GraphQL or so, this would all be possible. But out of the box, we speak something that is called JSON API. Who of you has heard or worked with JSON API? Okay, that's not too bad. Um, JSON API is a very lightweight format, of course, in JSON as the name gives away. And um, it allows you to um, define relationships between resources and then also um, reuse resources you uh, send back in this relationship. So. Um, I know that the question will come, so I will take it now. Um, why not GraphQL? <laughs> um, we are aware, we talked a lot to customers, and actually this fulfills all their requirements. Um, another thing is that all the code that we have is PHP. So you do not have to have someone who um, has to learn GraphQL. And furthermore, if you want to have your GraphQL node, uh, your GraphQL server, um, you can still put it in front and talk to our API. So there's nothing preventing you from anything like that. So this is the standard question. <laughs> um, we have a lot of e-commerce entities already in our system and um, the way we present them is through um, something that is, has a very specific naming convention as REST API modules. So um, Spryker is also built in a very modular way and all of the um, like business subdomains are encapsulated in modules that exclusively treat that bit of um, 
encapsulated business functionality that's only treating this one um, piece of the system. And for most of these entities that we already provide, we um, also have API endpoints. And um, for those that we do not yet provide, we are currently working on. So everything that you can use in a um, e-commerce system and in the Spryker case in a B2B e-commerce system, you will find um, a B2B endpoint already available. That meaning um, for the customer facing stuff. So um, import endpoints and these things are still in the works. We are um, currently specking these things. Um, but for everything that's facing to the customer, so everything that's displaying data and these things, and um, that actually allows for the conversion funnel, um, we already provide you with functionality out of the box. And of course, as I said, um, you can uh, put your custom development on top, or actually we encourage you and we like empower you to um, put your custom development on top. Same as here. Um, those of you who have used Spryker are also aware that there's a lot of explicit code. Why? I can also explain, but this is a topic for another day. And um, in the long run, I think it's beneficial. I will gladly also tell you why. And um, for beginners, this might look a bit scary, but relevant in most cases are actually just um, a reader and a mapper class inside of these um, resource modules that tell us how we read um, the data we want to present there and how we map it to the format we defined and um, that's supposed to be displayed. Um, we also implemented this um, relationship concept of the JSON API. That means we do not only have like um, these endpoints. Um, of course, we also have these endpoints, but um, you can actually theoretically infinitely combine these endpoints and uh, in creating relationships between those. Um, and then you can also reuse them because um, as I told you in the other uh, format, you um, tell it that you have um, a relationship to another entity and then you embed uh, the entity later in um, the data that's provided with the API. I hope I can also show you um, an example of that shortly. Um, versioning um, is a thing where we do not make assumptions about how your front ends work. So um, maybe we uh, provide something out of the box and we change the type of a field or we add a field and for some front ends, this might be a backward compatibility um, break. So, um, but since we do not know how your front ends work and we do not want you to talk to uh, version 1700 at some point to any of these API endpoints, we do not make assumptions about this. So. Um, if you know that um, an endpoint that was newly introduced or would cause a break um, in your API endpoint is irrelevant for the front ends you use, then um, it's irrelevant for you. You don't have to change your version. Otherwise, you can um, create a new version of your API endpoint and um, yeah, just um, serve that at, as the new specified version. So from our side, no assumptions about the version. It's um, entirely your choice. Um, we know that um, documentation is most of the time, especially in systems that evolve very quickly and that like grow very quickly, is a very difficult topic. Uh, maybe some people here uh, can sing a song about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so we decided to not make like um, documentation that is written somewhere um, that describes how the API looks like because we don't know from our side because your API is entirely um, under your control. And this is why we also provided um, possibilities for you to um, create an export file in the open API format, formerly known as Swagger. And um, this is also importable into um, a tool called Postman, and I hope that most of you already touched something with an API use Postman because it's an amazing tool that's also integratable into um, yeah, uh, CI pipelines, for example. So let's look at some code. I do not know. <laughs> I
I think yes, but what would be the difference? <laughs> oh, I'm interested. I will ask you later about this. What does the LD stand for? Okay, um, let's have a look at one of these REST API modules inside um, of our dependency. Um, let's take any one that uh, looks or sounds kind of um, okay-ish. Um, I think about something else. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, modules, <laughs> and most of them. So that looks good. So um, we already saw the um, amount of classes involved in um, the API endpoint we just saw, and um, there's a lot of infrastructural code that I do not want to talk about at the moment. Um, if you are interested in that and have not worked with Spryker so far, or if you have worked with Spryker so far and are interested in why we build it that way, please come talk to me. I can give you explanations for everything. Um, almost everything. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, first of all, we have um, these uh, controllers that also contain a bit of uh, documentation format that tell the um, Swagger API on how something is supposed to work. Um, here you can also uh, define what kind of actions your controller should have, so what kind of um, HTTP verbs you want to expose for this API endpoint. Um, inside um, here you um, also go to um, the actual implementation that is then based. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I can read just fine. <laughs> And it's, also, it's actually not that important what's inside here. So um, I actually just wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to give you a rough overview on how this looks. Um, Bernd, can you tell me how I can go back to the project thing in the presentation view? Command one. Thank you, <laughs> Bernd. This is why I'm here. <laughs> um, that's called key promoter, and it's the most ugly thing on purpose, um, <laughs> most probably. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, I should switch back to that. At some point, I turned it off, but yes. <laughs> I, did, I do not code that much lately, unfortunately. Um, so the, the, the point here is that you have um, the controllers where you can decide what kind of HTTP verb is um, exposed in your, um, in your API endpoint. You have um, the, the um, mappers and the um, readers that we talked about. And um, you have also the possibility to define something um, that's called um, the root plugin. This is actually where you like, um, no, actually this is the place where you uh, decide which HTTP verbs you serve, and the controller is the part where you actually do the implementation of that um, reaction to this HTTP verb. Okay, uh, long story short. Um, in the end, how do I leave this mode? That's too easy. <laughs> Escape also does not work. All my touch bar is open. Yeah. So um, we provide all these endpoints, and you could, uh, you can put, or we actually, like I said, encourage you to put your customizations on top of this. So um, at the end, you will uh, have the possibility to um, create. I 
けです。So, yes, we are still using Vagrant, but <laughs>、um, next week there will be、um, a conference that's called. <laughs> so, again, next week there will be a conference called Code Talks Commerce, and maybe someone、uh, will announce that we will transition away from Vagrant. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, okay, Vergant is not running. Okay, this should only take a moment. And、um, what I will actually want to show you then is that we have a console command that will take、um, all the configured API resources at that point.、Um, That means not only the ones available, but in Spryker you have to do a lot of things explicitly for good reason. And all the、um, configured resources at that point will be taken to、um, create a、um, Swagger file or an open API YAML file、um, that is consumable by anything that can、um, make a visualization for a Swagger API. And、um, yeah, just believe me, <laughs> I、uh, have prepared something. And、um, if you take this file then and go to Swagger Hub, or as I said, any、um, tool that is capable of displaying、um, an open API format, you will see all the API endpoints that you have currently configured in your system. You can see that you have.、Um, Endpoints that are handling authentication. You have endpoints for your catalog search.、Um, you will see what these endpoints are capable of, what parameters these、um, can potentially take, what they do expect, and also how the result format might look like. And、um, this format is not only consumable by、um, Swagger Hub. So theoretically, if you、um, have something that's publicly available. You could also um, run um, your API requests from Swagger Hub or any other Swagger、um, visualization tool that's capable of that、uh, directly from from the UI there. So,、um, but unfortunately, this is configured to communicate to something that's running locally, and of course, this will not work if I work with an online tool unless I take like something like Ngrok or any other、uh, things that allow me to connect the external world to my local system. But Um, there is also a tool that I just mentioned called Postman, and this also takes this exact、um, API specif specification format. And、um, this tool is actually built for、uh, working and testing APIs like HTTP requests. So、um, it started out as a、uh, Chrome plugin, I think, and most of you probably came into contact with that at some point in their career. So I remember it from like. I don't know. I don't want to say numbers, but many, many years ago.、Um, so you can um, see um, how endpoints、um, look, and you can basically do the same as in、uh, you could potentially do in Swagger Hub. But most interesting in this tool is also that you can、um, create scenarios. For example, something like a customer journey. So and this is exactly what I want to show you now.、Um, we、uh, will log in. So、um, huh, by coincidence, I'm still in the Tubino Wi-Fi. <laughs> Otherwise, this would not have worked. <laughs> so、um, we authenticate it with our credentials against the server, and we get an access token. This here is a、um, an encrypted JSON Web token that will subsequently like serve as Um, the authorization, authentication, and authorization provider in our、um, calls. In Postman, you can 
uh, save this one into um, environment variables. Um, theoretically, you should also be able to not make it environment specific, but also um, for this one collection specific, but there is a bug, so always go for the environment if you run into something that's not working. Um, then let's say we want to search something. Um, I chose Travelmate for no apparent reason. I think um, someone else from our company did this. Um, then you can like go from the search to the um, abstract products, which is, is a um, product model in Spryker terms. You can go to the um, product models, which is a variant. Um, then you can grab um, your cards because we have also multi-card features and you can add the item to your card. And then you also get your card functionality back. So everything you would expect from um, an API in the e-commerce context. Um, then you can also um, fetch all the data that might be necessary for the checkout. So under the condition of the current card, the user and a couple of other factors, theoretically even all factors that you decide are um, necessary. You can decide on um, payment methods, delivery methods, what uh, other options you have, want to provide there. Um, the user address book, so all this will um, be provided by this checkout data endpoint. And in the end, you can place your orders through the API here. So um, what you can also do, so what this allows us is to, um, for example, if we go for the concrete products, we see that we, no, this is not what I wanted. We see that we have um, this is not what I wanted. <laughs> uh, relationships to other entities inside here. Why? Give me a second. Um, you have uh, IDs of other <coughs> entities that you embed in your response and they should actually be included uh, at the bottom here. So now I'm a bit... Startled. Damn. So uh, if, if nothing works, I have a video that will uh, <laughs> show you how this is supposed to work. Um, that should also be available on YouTube shortly. Uh, maybe if I go to my local environment and I look for an abstract product, of course. Um, hmm. Okay, I... I have to show you a video, I'm very sorry. So um, actually what you should have uh, seen here is the thing that I um, earlier um, showed you in the presentation, um, that you have um, relationships here that you can define and um, you actually just link to other um, entities that are inside of these relationships things. So um, inside of your um, data, you um, for example have authors and comments and um, I think I should do it fully in five minutes of the video and then we are also probably about done with Stefan. Do we have time? I'm not out of minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so believe me, uh, we can talk about this later. Um, what the, the key point here is that we um, have an existing e-commerce system with very um, mature and battle-proven um, e-commerce functionality underlying. And we, um, due to the um, infrastructure for a build for performance, we were able to um, go with the, the trends of the last years and also um, successfully evolve the whole system to uh, transition to an API-first approach. So everything we do from here is um, that we build it with API first in mind. Um, and 
um, the customizability and the built-in performance of the sprite car architecture are preserved in all these approaches. So um, with that in mind, you know that you are prepared for whatever is to come. And um, what I did not manage to show you is that you can also like um, <coughs> chain your uh, relationships. Relationships do not have to be on a technical level. You um, can decide everything you have in plugins that are just PHP code, so you're completely free uh, doing whatever you want. And um, you can custom tailor your responses like you would probably do in GraphQL. Um, where you uh, chain all the resources you need, you can reduce them to the fields you actually just need, and you have um, a response in a single HTTP round trip that contains everything you need to display something in your application, however this might look. Thank you. <laughs> This guy. You have uh, two big concepts. You mentioned memory and video. Yes. What is the most worth uh, price? Um, no, why? Cost something, eight years. Yes, but this would be rather the responsibility of um, the backend API. We have endpoints that do that but they are not writing something, but they are like um, a layer on top of this client that I showed you. So they are like accepting data, maybe transforming it a bit, like to uh, uh, like be um, in the right format for whatever you want to pass on, transfer objects, you remember that? And um, they go then through the client. So yes, there are not, there's nothing called the writer component in this case. No, no, but because um, these, this REST API for um, the state it is in now is meant for front-end applications. And front-end applications are in most cases, so out of the box at least, um, not meant to um, create such things like product data. So they um, can create, of course, checkout, something like this. They, they um, combine something that we call a quote and um, pass this onto the checkout process to create the order from this but um, they're not capable of importing, for example, product data. This is um, uh, the responsibility of another type of Glue application. So the infrastructure will stay the same. It's just connected to a different way to the um, backend functionality. And this will most likely provide functionality like this. Um, of course, you are free to do that yourself. You remember customizability. And um, I remember people here that worked with me on projects where we built like the opposite of a checkout process where you would have to have these capabilities of like as a, um, yeah, not, not customer, but as a prosumer or something um, who is able to insert data into the system beyond a checkout. So not yet. <laughs> yes. Uh, actually we have, um, like uh, as a system that you can reuse. So um, you can use these um, endpoints and uh, implement um, an additional interface and then give them a version. So you have like major and minor numbers that you can use there. Theoretically, you can also extend that, but that's um, irrelevant. Um, by default, it will always serve um, the latest version. The um, resources delivered out of the box by Spryker are not versioned at all. That means if you put any new version on top, and you want to still serve the out-of-the-box resource to some endpoint, you first would have to give it a version number, but this is like a two-line change. And then you can also um, extend that and um, yeah, um, add versioned endpoints as you see fit from there. I think that uh, the colleagues from the agencies who work more with that are more um, like uh, proficient in that, but um, in most cases it is not the point that you just deploy a part of it, but you would always deploy Spryker as a mono repo thing. Um, so at least the project code, which is not that much. And then um, the uh, host that points to this um, node would decide 
uh, what application it wants to talk to. So it uh, would decide on what front end controller to talk to and what directory and what kind of environment it sets for that node. So um, you would deploy everything, but the configuration on how you talk to this node would decide what kind of application you're talking to. More questions? Um, that will stay. There are a lot of customers that are, um, for the moment, only interested in this template-based front-end approach. So um, Glue is not meant uh, to replace Eve anytime soon. Uh, Glue is just an addition, like a complement, you say, to, to Eve. So Eve will not go anywhere anytime soon. So Eve at some point used to write Glue APIs? Um, I don't think so. Um, that's rather unusual, right? Because even if you built a web application, you would build it with more like JavaScript -y technology in the front end and let it talk to um, an API. Because otherwise you would um, add latency to the whole process. It's possible, of course, but um, without more context, I don't see that much reason to do so. If you could visualize the client, would you do it? Mm, no. Um, the client is like the, the piece that um, decides where to take the data from, like reaching yeah. through to the back end or going to um, uh, the data stores. But um, Glue actually for the front end applications at least sits on top of the client. So of course you could replace the client in some way with that. But um, this is a case of when you have a good hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So. <laughs> I, I don't see a reason to do so. Maybe you have or have a customer with a reason to do so, then we could together probably find a solution and uh, also evaluate how much sense the solution makes. <laughs> yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, this will be like the first time I do it uh, such, uh, I mean, I do such a uh, topic without any slide uh, because I wanted to try a full live coding and see where, where it, it goes. Uh, so we'll, you, we will see code. Uh, but first, uh, I need to just introduce uh, so myself. I'm like the, the lead developer of FrontCommerce, which is a, a front-end solution uh, for e-commerce. But it was built uh, by an agency uh, who named Oxitech, who did a lot of uh, shops, but al also custom applications. So uh, the goal here uh, today is not about the product. It's much more about the stack and why uh, we think it's uh, a good choice uh, for the next-gen commerce solutions. Uh, so front commerce is two things, a React application. Uh, so this is really a progressive web app, like we said right now, but it's a, it's a single page application built with React. So React and other uh, let's recent JavaScript frameworks uh, brought uh, a whole new thing that that's named component-based UIs, and this is a really uh, nice shift in terms of uh, UI development. And it goes uh, very well with uh, GraphQL. So GraphQL is in front commerce, uh, so GraphQL is a standard, 
and there are implementations in JavaScript, PHP, uh, Elixir, uh, Python, and all that stuff. Uh, so we, we are using the Node.js uh, version. So we have uh, both things, and the, the, um, the goal is that the GraphQL middleware uh, is the, the only backend for the front-end application, which is the React, but uh, let's say you, you, you can have many other things. And then it will dispatch uh, to the different services you may have or the big monolith you have. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and the third, it's not a technology, but uh, we started it in 2015. We prototyped for one year, and we have shops in production since more than one year now. So we've, we've done through all the, the things uh, related to running that stack in production, uh, scaling, Black Fridays, uh, uh, all everything related to login deployments and all that stuff. So I, we could talk about that afterwards if you, if you want. Um, so front commerce is first, uh, th this is one of the first uh, front commerce websites that uh, came out. Yeah, it sells guns and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Uh, so this is uh, actually a Magento 2. Uh, monolith in, in the back. And so this is kind of standard uh, e-commerce uh, features. And you see that, well, it works. <laughs> but uh, since six months now, we've also had a new solution, we, uh, a new store that has been built with uh, front commerce. There are al also others, but this one is interesting because uh, actually you can browse uh, so it's kind of fast, uh, I have, it's like on the web. Uh, but this is faster than the first one because in the back end there is no Magento here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and actually this is a WordPress uh, shop but without WooCommerce. WordPress is used to, uh, to upload these beautiful pictures, uh, manage all these content, and also have some kind of prices, but it's a bit difficult because when you start a reservation process, then you have a lot of options, you need to select dates, so this is a really difficult checkout uh, to implement, and it takes values from everywhere, and if I continue, I don't know if there are availabilities because <laughs> I will try. Hopefully at some point I may have some kind of dates. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I can have a calendar, so I need to say, show me everything that match all the criteria that I clicked before, and when is that available, and what's the price for them, uh, so here. So basically we have this WordPress website that does all the content management, then there is a microservice totally dedicated to that use case because it's very particular uh, that allows to get all the criteria and send the, the prices and the availabilities for uh, this customization. And here, if you, if you see when I click that, it takes a while. And it's not because it's Magento, it's because it's a worse uh, <laughs> system, it's their ERP that directly reachable through the API with that particular uh, set of criteria because we need to ensure uh, in real time that the availability is here. And then we are, I won't pay here, uh, but uh, basically then we are directly uh, discussing to the payment provider to, to place the order. And when the order is paid, then we push that to the uh, ERP. So this is e-commerce with the, the tools for that particular customer, but in the front end, those are all uh, front commerce uh, core features and existing components that have been plus or less customized. So here is why uh, this stack I think is interesting, uh, because as a front end developer, you will have this uh, kind of uh, local style guide where you can 
uh, see all your components. I, I said that that was a component-based uh, workflow. Uh, so I can say this is my default alert, but there is a success state, which is green, an error state, which is orange also, uh, a gray one. And what happens with those edge cases that you may are used to, to put in your unit tests, like if I have a lot of content, the first time that was re very <coughs> ugly, but then here is how we did that. Uh, so as a front-end developer, you could just, uh, let me have extendable card, so if I go to the extendable card, by default, it looks like that. But then if I, oh, I'm gonna add some, some content here. When I save, I see the update uh, live here. So I don't know if I want to make a form here. I can work as a front-end developer uh, that way with almost instant feedback and without the need for any backend. So in terms of productivity, this is very, very interesting. And I can also view how that works in responsive mode, kind of. Uh, I can also try and really play with my component here in the UI. And let's say that I want to say that when it's extended, uh, no, not extended, I want to see hide it. Then I can ensure it works that way. And this is very important because this is a uh, front-end uh, specific things that I, we think uh, front-end developers will be more and more used to work with. And when they will uh, have to, let's say, start working on a new e-commerce system, Spryker, Magento, uh, any, anyone, they, they will be frustrated because they don't have that. And if you want to build nice user experience, this will be kind of a must have. Um, by the way, here, um, who is doing PHP development? Okay, who is doing JavaScript development? Okay, and who understands that kind of syntax here? In JavaScript, the ES6, okay. I try to make it uh, a bit more readable than that because that's <laughs> that's what you when you when you do JavaScript for a long time then you you write like like that, but uh, don't hesitate to ask me if you don't understand some code. Do you still have uh, one This expandable card here is React code. So this is a React component. And the kind of unit tests that we saw earlier is that. This is a story. So we say here is the default use case and here is how to use that in that default use case. And it acts also as documentation for the future developers that will uh, came here. And if you find a new edge case, you can just add one and that will work. Uh, and also uh, in, a, in a component directory, so this is what, this is our choice in front commerce, uh, but we really think it's, it allows to have everything uh, collocated here. So we saw the component, its story, and then here we have his styles. So the, the, this we use SAS, but those are the styles for that. That component was what we name a UI component, but it starts being more interesting when you come to, um, let's say, uh, more business components. So this is uh, a mini cart item that displayed in the in the UI. So here is, oh, it's by default, and where there are two uh, items in that. 
we can have more cases. Uh, and here, in that case, The component is a bit complicated, but this is uh, what allows you to do a Stripe checkout. Uh, so the component is a bit m complex, but actually this is a React component that displays, well, things. And <laughs> there is a code form here with data styles uh, here. And the story, of course, uh, and here, we are mocking something named uh, a, a, an Apollo decorator. Basically, we are mocking a GraphQL endpoint, remote endpoint. So here we say when you, the Stripe component, will do a GraphQL request to the backend, uh, when you will ask a client secret for a Stripe payment token, then you will have this value. We can that way mock uh, the, the server to say, let's say, if there is an error, if it's very slow, if it's loading, and then you can simulate a lot of things, and you don't hit a backend. Uh, and also, because this component did some kind of GraphQL query, uh, we have collocated the GraphQL query in the same directory. So here, we have uh, kind of like the SQL query made by that component. And this is in a, uh, let's say, technology agnostic uh, description. So that was the part for the front end. Just keep that in memory uh, because this is strictly typed. So you can have tools that say that maybe here I've made a typo. So as a front end developer, I will see uh, my mistake very early, and then we I can communicate with backend developer more easily because I have tooling for that. Uh, so now that was for GraphQL on the front end, and uh, I will show you why f if you have a, a good API building a GraphQL endpoint for front end developers is kind of easy and in my opinion a good thing to do. Uh, so front commerce is a paid version. Uh, I mean, there is a license, so you, you get access to the code as we see, but uh, you cannot use that uh, tomorrow if you want. So in the documentation somewhere uh, here, okay. We have a link to something named front commerce Lite, which is basically the same concepts uh, and it's used so you could understand this technology and, uh, and start very easily to start working with that without configuring Webpack, Babel, all that new things that you might have seen on some blog posts that say that suck. Uh, so we are going to use that. Um, basically, it's an e-commerce application. Uh, I don't know if that, if that works. No. So this is a very simple uh, e-commerce application. You do git clone, npm install, and npm start. You will see that. Uh, and a coffee you will have also. Um, so basically here I, g I fetch products. I see them on the home page. I can browse their product page, which is very simple, like designers show you in the first stage of a design. Then the customer comes and say, oh, but I need that, that, and that feature. Uh, I can add that to the cart here. And I cannot do checkout because that's a light version and we don't really care about all that features. But here I send, I read information to display products and then I do uh, what's named in GraphQL a, a mutation. So I uh, mutated the state of something. And also in the front end, because we are microservice ready, I have some random information uh, of fake uh, user data here from another microservice. That's great. 
And this is. Uh, so these information are coming from uh, here. This GraphQL endpoint. Uh, so I asked for the category. Oh. I asked for the category uh, of ID 48, the third, uh, the three first products, and there's Q and name, and I get that data. So, but if I want to ask, uh, I don't know, what do I ask? Uh, their email, for instance. I can ask it, and it comes back. So this is kind of Postman uh, that we showed earlier. Uh, it's named uh, GraphQL Playground, and it's, you can plug it on any GraphQL server. Um, and basically what we can see is that as a front-end developer, uh, I mean, no, when a front-end developer will ask or a client will ask some data, there are only those data that will uh, go into the into internet. Uh, <laughs> and this is no matter of, I don't know, they are, uh, accept products, I don't know if I accept products. Like, I can go very, very deep into the graph and get all the information that I want. So those information actually comes from Magento, uh, but we'll see that we can change that. Also, these tools, this tool has uh, also some kind of documentation. So from the schema, which is a strictly type, a graphical schema is typed, you can have some comments, uh, so some typing, so you know what are the mandatory parameters and optional parameters also, I don't know, uh, here. In my category, for instance, the layers. This is a query input, and a query input type has uh, all those kind of parameters, so I can uh, change them. Also, I can search here if I want a card. I can see all the types, and so this is very convenient for uh, front-end developers. And uh, actually, it acts as uh, a contract between back-end and front-end developers. And we can start with fake data with uh, in that. Then front-end developers do their thing, back-end developers do their thing, and hopefully that works. Hopefully. Um, so this was um, the whole FrontCommerce API, so this is everything that we've implemented into FrontCommerce. There are also mutations, add item to cart, and all that stuff. Uh, and actually, I don't have the code here on my machine. Um, so this is something named uh, GraphQL Remote Schema Stitching. So basically it's take that GraphQL schema there on that server, put it in my bigger graph. But then I can also have my store information. I think it's here. So here, I asked information from my local data source that fetch data from another system, and I've created that graph and that schema, and it's merged with the remote uh, front commerce Magento schema. And that we could do first here, it's a top level thing, but I could do that in the product. Here, I could ask like the store information if that was relevant, and that would work. And we could stitch everything together, and uh, that way we could add features in two separate uh, parts of the code base, or even my architecture in two microservices, and have them consumed in a transparent way by front-end developers. This is, in my opinion, uh, something that's really interesting because when you're a developer, you're adding and designing things for a product and you want the store or the stock for a store 
I mean, like the store, the stock of this product in one or two stores, for instance. And you, you, don't, you don't really care if there are two microservices different or if it's implemented in Elasticsearch or any, I don't know. Uh, so this is how it's consumed and it's really, in my opinion, the, a, a very good entry point for front-end developers. So uh, I will just make it much more easier now. I will remove some kind of magic. It's those are feature flags in an environment variable. Uh, so I will use, I will, I will just remove the schema stitching and if I'm correct, you should see that actually <laughs> there is nothing ready in my graph because we've done some work in front commerce. So here that there are just the store information. So if I run this query again, I will have an error saying that there is no category top level query on, on, on that thing. So I can comment it. And, and then it will still run with just my local thing. We'll do something funnier. I've implemented a totally fake local uh, store that just is uh, exposing the part of the graph that are used by this simple application. So this is a totally different implementation with the same interface and I haven't changed here my front end code and you see that works. So those are totally fake, oh, crap. Oh. It's totally fake, the names are, I mean, it's faker uh, so I go on the page, I can add it to the cart. It's added, wow, that's amazing. But this is totally fake data. Uh, let's take a look at how it's implemented here. So that would be, so I have a modules file where I can register uh, new modules and I say that here if the feature shop bridge is fake, I will add this fake shop module. And then there is one for Maltin, we'll see afterward. Um, so the fake shop module is very simple. It has, this is, uh, I mean, this is code that's close to what's in front commerce. We have uh, more features in front commerce to, to manage dependencies, um, caching mechanisms and things like that. But this is very uh, also something that's very uh, common in the GraphQL ecosystem in JavaScript. You will have all these elements. So not necessarily the namespace, but here we have one because it's a module, it needs a name. You have type definitions and resolvers. So the type definitions are imported from a GraphQL schema file. This is uh, a very simple text file that declares my, uh, the data that my modules will expose. So here I said uh, that the top level query implements the catalog queries from front commerce and the card queries from front commerce. So that means that I have to have a category uh, features. I, I could, uh, yeah, I will show that. I have extracted these interfaces into, uh, into GraphQL uh, files. So those are public interfaces and common interfaces. Uh, so catalog queries and card queries here. So, if I open my file uh, here, I implement these interfaces and also the other one. And my, uh, let's say, a category, so my fake category that implements the category types, then as name and layer. So, this is public uh, interface, and then the real code is in resolver. 
So a resolver is something that will say that for the query type and for the category field of that type, then uh, I will do that, uh, well, this one is much more easier. For the, the, the product, the, the top level product, I have a skew parameter here. So I will use that to find the product in the catalog. Of course, in a real use case, you will do some, a lot of API calls, but uh, this is how that works. And that was the top level query, but I can say that for any, uh, let's say, yeah, any cart item, the quantity will be one, because I haven't <laughs> handled uh, adding multiple things in the cart. And I can also convert data. And no mat that means that no matter where the fake cart item is fetched from and where it's exposed, if it's in the card query or in my uh, previous order that has a card item, then every time this will be called when we, when a front-end developer, no matter where in the graph, will try to to uh, to get a quantity for a fake card item. Now let's say that we have a real API in the back. Um, I will use here, I will change that. I will use multi. If I run it, I will still see hopefully all the products here. But those are our products from my uh, Maltin backend, so I had to, to find some pictures. And here, if I send a add to cart mutation, I don't think I can do it. No. Here, trust me, it says a no type cart. And hopefully, if I had the, the tooling set up on that project, I will have seen it uh, before going in production. Uh, but actually, it said me that uh, Maltin doesn't have any card types. So if I go into the backend of the Maltin implementation here, I could have seen that very easily because the type query doesn't implement the catalog card. Uh, and then the implementation in a real use case, uh, well, not, that's not a real use case. Actually, most of that logic, which is uh, very related to Maltin, that could be uh, extracted into pure JavaScript code that could be reused in any JavaScript solution or imported from any JavaScript implementation. And here, it's just a, a tiny layer that says that when you ask a layer from a Maltin category to fetch data, you will just do that call, and this is a Maltin call, but uh, that's very easy to do. I I try to go back because that's the first time I, I do that, and uh, as I said earlier, I'm I'm very very bad at time management, so <laughs> I'm just half the, the talk. But I think we need to go faster. <laughs> so I will just. Multi-me typing uh, very, very fast. Um, okay, so here I should have a simple CMS module. Uh, and in my hands, I will go back to Magento. Here. And start it again. Okay, so. So this is uh, content that comes from Magento, base CMS feature. I don't have extracted any uh, kind of uh, interfaces in GraphQL, but I've created a kind of new uh, 
uh, new feature that does almost the same, but in a better way, because like in e-commerce, if you want to start building nice shops, of course there are awesome e-commerce backends that know uh, how to do B2B e-commerce, uh, very, uh, very custom features, and that scale with a lot of products. But there are also people in the marketing team that say, okay, but your CMS here, it just sucks. So, okay, you have like the best in class e-commerce solution, but I cannot drop my big image like that uh, to, to be on the front end. And then you will have maybe a totally speci specialized uh, content management system for that part. And maybe there are also other people that will do some kind of predictive analytics and they would like, and all that people would like to merge everything together. So here I've implemented a very awesome uh, content management system that says uh, in almost the same thing that for these identifiers, I want the title, the content, and also the source code. So here the source code is Markdown because marketing people love Markdown. Uh, and we need to display uh, HTML on the front end. So this is something that will take files in Markdown, call an API to transform them to HTML, and then display that on, that on the front page. It should have worked, but not now. Uh, anyway, the code for that, trust me, you will see the, the information, but the code for that is very simple. Uh, it's so a namespace module. So this is a loader that contains all my business logic. This is pure JavaScript code. And here is all it needed uh, in my GraphQL module. Uh, to put that into the global graph. So I needed to say that there was a type, uh, a my content field in my query, uh, and a simple page was as that field. Uh, and then when I asked for my content here, I will just uh, go over all the identifiers and call my loader with a load by ID uh, method that will hopefully uh, send me at some point uh, the, the data back. And also here, for the content, I take, I use the source uh, from the, the file, so this is the markdown source, and I convert, convert it to HTML. So no matter where the data from a simple page comes from, file system, remote API, I don't know, as soon as it's markdown, I can convert here the source to HTML. So this is very uh, located and uh, sp you can split it by features. The last thing here is that this loader, it's created here in a context and that could be, uh, that's where you could inject some, uh, some, yeah, let's say uh, some objects that can communicate with an API with a predefined uh, user token, authentication tokens, for instance, and you can inject dependencies depending on your current request, and you will make them available in the, the resolvers. So this is dependency and injection. And then uh, the loader is, well, so to convert a markdown to HTML, it will just do a post to the GitHub API, uh, if you didn't know, they have an API that converts modern to HTML. Uh, and it will return the data. And to fetch the files, it will go in the file system, in a directory, data, content, use the identifier as a markdown, uh, I mean, uh, as a file name, and uh, return the data, read the data, and, and send them. So here, I have my markdown files, and I can do uh, whatever I want here, and hopefully if I ask about that, I have my new content, this is markdown, and here, if I do another one, I have an e error because, well, error management is not very well implemented here, uh, but 
it's because I don't have any test uh, files. But if I create another one, uh, hopefully, ah, crap. Oh, no. <laughs> ah, my, oh, that was so ugly that my server crashed. So <laughs> don't do that at, at home. This is JavaScript. So here is an overview of uh, how with very, uh, very few lines of code you can either get remote data from a GraphQL endpoint. Uh, we have in plans uh, to do that also, I think, for JSON API um, because Drupal is using, is using that, OroCommerce is using that, well, a lot of people and those are similar concepts, so I think that might exist at some point. And also to implement your own features and uh, also uh, experiment and develop very quickly some dirty features, but for customers uh, that works because they have their data here and they can have a store locator in a few, a few hours. Uh, and then you prototype the front end and when you're sure that that works, you, you will put that awesome microservice to handle store locators. Uh, yeah, so. You can try now. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes. This is something named Storybook. Uh, I can ac actually here. I think I have the. I have the latest version on that project. Uh, and this is uh, a tool that allows you to build those components. First, it was for React, but now there are implementations and adapters for Vue.js, Angular, React Native also. And their new interface, it, it, yeah, it was released, I think, a few, a few weeks ago. Uh, it's much more nicer. You could have everything, uh, so you, you can have directories, you can have markdown, uh, you can zoom, you can uh, switch also like the, the background, you can, and you, you can have a lot of plugins here that uh, shows you content. Like for instance, in front commerce, we have a custom plugin here that allows you to switch language so it uh, analyzes the, the strings that you have, uh, the international internationalized strings that you have, and it allows you to see if, like, you guys are German, so most of the time German language breaks all the UI. So, <laughs> 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 so yeah, this is for those use cases. <laughs> Sorry, I don't speak German at all. <laughs> Other questions? Yes? Just to confirm, the um, e-commerce functionality is specific to Adobe Textiles. This is provided by Eve, right? Or this is custom? Uh, yes. Uh, right. I, I mean, for, for, for now, front commerce has a core, uh, a very small core. So if you remove uh, almost everything and you just have the core, you have a naked uh, graph. Uh, and then we have, uh, f for now, a Magento 2 uh, module that covers most of the Magento 2 features. Yeah. And then we also, uh, like, in the next few months, we will have the first Magento 1 uh, stores and adapters. And we are also working with multi and other ones. So that's our business and our value will provide the base thing for lots of solutions. 
and uh, then you can also uh, develop your own uh, thing. Like for the, the project that I showed with the calendars and things, we have our own checkout uh, mechanism. Uh, yeah, because there are a lot of custom logic. So uh, it's we're for now we are still looking for feedbacks from people, but uh, uh, I don't know which change is last week. It's uh, fifteen thousand euros for uh, like. Anyway, uh, we will con uh, continue afterwards. But basically, you have a, a one-time fee, and then you can have updates every year for six thousand euros. And uh, you, we do also some kind of support uh, if needed, trainings and all that stuff. But yes. Uh, it's really you get the license to then do of. However you want, it's like an open source software, but you just need to pay for that. So you, you get the code, it's an obfuscated, you can deploy wherever you want. And we, uh, right now we are looking for partners that uh, knows uh, solutions, let's say Sprikers or I don't know, uh, uh, because we, I, I think that in the long run we don't want to be expert in each technology. We know Magento very well, WordPress also, uh, but not all, that's impossible. Um, and for instance, Magento One is developed by a partner, and they do the the connector on Magento side. Um, so yeah, we are also look, looking maybe for a, a platform as a service solutions to deploy that because that's a Node.js server, so that's very standard thing. But we don't want to to yeah, we we want to stay focused on just the product because. Uh, the front-end parts actually are becoming more and more uh, complex. So I don't know if you guys know Gatsby. Okay, so you know it's very fast. And I will show you, if you haven't done, the, the link component in Gatsby. So it's just an HTML A tag. Gatsby link code base that allows you to preload the next page very fast and do all that kind of optimization for you. And basically the front end is becoming that uh, uh, difficult if you want to achieve a uh, high level of performance. You want to demonstrate, demonstrate what? I have a good uh, demonstration website for you to Oh yeah. The same for images, the same for everything. Like, uh, yeah, we, we also have that n that thing uh, in front commerce is that the images are really optimized for the size where it's displayed and know for what it be, has been uploaded in the back end. So, because images are what takes the most of. Responsive. Thank you so much. This was about code, I would say. Are you already very tired? Because what we will let you, what we will let you when it comes to shirts. So even though I had three hours to think about how to do it, I did not come up with a good method. But what I would say is, Tom, 
Should we call it a day? Yeah, it is a day. Thank you so much. Our, do our speakers definitely uh, persist on doing the panel discussion because then we could do the panel discussion over drinks and talk where uh, there is beer. Uh, <laughs> if you want so. <laughs> I would say this was it for today. Um, we're closing up here. So you can stay longer, uh, a little bit longer if you want and have another beer with us here. And then I probably say we don't have anything to do. Let's go to the drinks and talk panel and have a drink on that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, what could we improve actually? If there is anything we could improve, and I guess there's a lot, uh, tell us on Twitter, tell us on the meetup, everywhere you want. If you took some pictures, please upload them either from or tweet them or just, you know, uh, use the social media channels. Follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, our handle is Cody underscore Berlin, underscore Berlin, the other one, because I don't want to call you that. And uh, if you by any chance in Stuttgart, Leipzig, Fano, uh, Lissabon, uh, Düsseldorf, or Porto, Porto, yeah, Porto, um, yeah, you could also find us there because we call it coding in the city. Anything I forgot? Any questions now, maybe? How about the meetup? Ah, there are lots of meetup options. The next coding Berlin meetup. Uh, this is what you always announce, but I, I, we don't have it. Okay. So the next, the next <laughs> conference, the next conference I can recommend is. That day, which is yeah, happening at Festival Deutschberg. Yes, question. There is also next week the uh, Kongshaus Commerce for Thursday and Friday. Very good. Uh, I heard there is a brilliant speaker uh, at Code Talk <laughs> on Friday at 12. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> this is the Thursday at 5. <laughs> <laughs> You're Thursday 5, I'm Friday 12. Okay, very nice. Go there, the tickets are cheap. It's 400 euros. Blockchain, I can recommend blockchain. I even got blockchain as a, ha as a hashtag on the name of that. Anything? The first one wins. Stop it. Test automation. Test automation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with Golang, <laughs> obscure programming languages. Okay, if you don't come up with anything besides test automation, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> your fault. <laughs> <laughs> yours. I will consider. I will consider. Okay, very nice. Say goodbye to Tom. Say goodbye to me. It's a meeting, and uh, yeah. I